in the anti-activist chill post 9-11, that movement died. Not our individual movements. They, for the most part, remained intact. Some of them expanded. But that coming together broke apart. That movement of movements, as we called it at, a time, at the time. And many of us went back, uh, some of us fearfully, into our respective silos. Now, that breakup happened for many reasons. That's part of what I explored in my last book, in The Shock Doctrine, about how moments of crisis, of shock, make us lose our story, our narrative. Um, and in large part, that book was driven by that experience of, of being part of a movement that was kind of shocked out of existence before its time. The reason I think it's worth looking back is not out of some nostalgia, uh, because that movement was far from perfect. And I think already this convergence is getting things right that we didn't get right. I think that the leadership of First Nations people that has been, and the respect that has been in, uh, a huge part of organizing this summit and the success of this convergence um, is something we didn't do um, as well in 2001. But I think one thing that we, that, that we did do right back then is that we weren't talking about the personalities of individual politicians or the marginal differences between political parties. We weren't spending too much time talking about that at all or our respective electoral strategies. What we were really talking about was the economic system that underlied all of that, underneath it all. And that was not just free trade, it wasn't globalization as it was often called. We were talking about capitalism. And that's what we were talking about when September 11th changed the conversation. And it's taken too long, I think, for us to come together once again, but it is happening and it is significant and we must acknowledge the importance of that. So what is it that's bringing us together? I think it's a lot, it's a lot of different factors. Um, in 2000, 2001, uh, we were coming together because our various issues um, were being knit together by the ambition of these tra free trade deals, right? They were reaching into all of our lives, whether we were educators or healthcare workers, indigenous people, immigrants, everybody was affected by the ambition of this architecture. I used to say that we should thank the World Trade Organization because they built our coalitions for us um, with their sheer ambition. Um, and one of the things that's been happening over particularly the, the, fa the past five years is that we find ourselves in the midst of an extraction frenzy in this country, particularly around fossil fuels, but not exclusively around fossil fuels. Um, and we see this obviously with the tar sands, with fracking, we see it in large scale mining pro projects, mining disasters, although as my friend Harsha Walia pointed out recently, mining is a disaster, um, certainly at that scale. We see it in that metal monster of pipelines stretching towards us in all directions, Northern Gateway, Kinder Morgan, Energy East, Line 9. And just as the virtual tentacles of those trade deals brought us together before, now the very real tentacles of this extraction infrastructure is bringing us together. This infrastructure of death bringing us together to defend life and building new coalitions to do that. And once again, I think we have to be clear. Ultimately, this is not about stopping individual pipelines or an individual mine. It's not even about stopping the tar sands. It's about the logic fueling all of it. The logic that sacrifices life on the altar of money. And this is the same logic that our social movements who are focused on fighting poverty, fighting for housing rights, for healthcare rights, for education rights, are also fighting that fundamental battle between life, profit, life, and money.
a system that would sacrifice the lives of certain people because they're deemed less valuable. Um, this is the logic at play in the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. It's the logic that we see at play right now in Ferguson um, with the sacrificing of young African American lives. And I think it is the same logic that treats certain people as fundamentally disposable that is at the heart of the extractive economy, that declares certain areas to be acceptable sacrifice zones in the name of turning Canada into an energy superpower. It's a supremacist logic. It's a supremacist, supremacist logic that divides the world relentlessly into somebodies and nobodies, into somewheres and nowheres, or worst of all, the middle of nowheres. This is a logic that founded this country we called Canada. It is embedded so deeply in the logic of colonialism, which was always based on the myth of nobodies and nowheres and sacrifice zones. And it is this logic, I believe, fundamentally that we must name and that we must build a movement to counter. Because we are living in a historic time where what we do in the next 10 years determines the fates for generations to come. Because we're not just living in a moment where it's only a river, a mountain, a watershed, a culture, a species being sacrificed in the name of economic growth. It's all this and more. It's the stability of all of Earth's systems that support life. Friends, we are up against a psychotic logic that has profoundly confused destruction with creation. And that is what we have to change, not just by saying no to Harper's worst ideas, though we have to do that, but by proposing and demonstrating real alternatives, relationships to the land and relationships with one another that are not based on creating ever larger sacrifice zones, but on protecting and regenerating life in everything that we do. And, you know, we often hear when we talk about climate change in particular that, you know, it's about the fact, it's, it's about that we don't have um, the political will or that we don't have the right technologies. But the truth is, is, it's not an absence of alternatives. I think we all know what we need to do. It's been clear for a long time. I think fundamentally it's an absence of conviction that we are up to this tremendous task, which we must admit is a terrifying task. It is both a huge responsibility and a huge honor to be alive and breathing in a moment such as ours. We know where the current system, if left unchecked, is headed. We also know how that system will deal with the reality of serial climate-related disasters. It will deal with it in the same way it deals with every crisis, with escalating barbarism, with ever more segregation between the small pool of winners and the ever-expanding pool of so-called losers with rampant disaster capitalism. We know that story. Lord knows I've told that story. To arrive at that dystopia, one we have imagined so many times in every sci-fi movie you could go to from Elysium to Mad Max to Snowpiercer, every time we imagine the future, it is that world big winners and big losers. And to get there, all we have to do is nothing. Nothing. Just keep barreling down the road we're on. We don't even need to veer, let alone turn. The only remaining variable is whether some countervailing power will emerge to block that road and simultaneously clear alternative pathways to destinations that are far safer. That is the task before us. A movement capable of imagining other futures than that dystopic story we keep telling ourselves over and over again. A story about how we come together in crisis rather than apart. 
a story about how we find our best selves amidst those challenges, because we know that it goes one way or the other. And I always said this when I was talking about the shock doctrine. When crisis hits us, whether collectively or individually, and we know this, we either fall apart or we find reserves of strength we never knew we had. We are tested in crisis, and we are being tested. We can already see glimpses of these kinds of transformative movements, particularly in the fights where those life and death struggles are playing out in people's lives firsthand. I've been lucky enough to spend the past five years researching the rise of what some call the fossil fuel resistance. It's more than that. It is a movement against this logic of extractivism. I've seen it in this country, an incredible movement against the Northern Gateway Pipeline, which is a movement that is so much driven by love as opposed to hate. You know, it is, and, it, and it is building those rare coalitions and healing, in many ways, his, historical wounds because settlers are realizing that the only barrier to Harper's unending dream of extraction is, are the rights of First Nations people. Um, and this is not based on charity. Um, it's, it is based on respect and it's based on gratitude. And this is a major change in this country. But I've also seen this in movements, an incredible movement um, in Halkidiki, Greece, where communities, a Canadian gold mining company called El Dorado, um, and the way they're coming together, you know, people talk about how these are the, the most, it's the most intergenerational struggle they've ever been a part of. They say, we used to leave the old people at home to just watch television, but then we discovered they were the only ones who knew how to cook for 50 people. And they knew how to cultivate, um, you know, collectively. And they knew how to care for the land, and we had to learn from them. And, um, you know, it's so interesting, this, this, this company, that this company is called El Dorado, right? This is this highly kind of genocidal name. And it's almost like the, the, the European colonizers are coming home to pillage themselves, right? Um, and, and this is what this you know, moment is bringing. It's not that this is new phenomenon. It's that the sacrifice zone is getting bigger and bigger because the appetite is so voracious. And we see this spirit, of, we certainly saw it in El Sepuktuk. Um, we see it in fights against fracking all over the world where people are putting water um, first. We see it in fights in, against coal plants in Andhra Pradesh, India. We see it in an incredible shift in China, which is always you know, such a handy scapegoat in all of these discussions. Nothing we do matters because you know, China is opening a coal plant a week. We hear it all the time. There is an, a raging debate in China about the cost of this kind of economic development because people can't breathe, because people can't let their, uh, let their kids play outside. They have to send their kids to school wearing masks. I mean, there's nothing more fundamental than the right to breathe. And that right is being sacrificed in the name of growth and progress. And it is leading to a fundamental questioning of economic growth in the fastest growing economy in the world. Things are changing. You look up and down the Pacific Northwest at the incredible resistance movements against export to coal export terminals. Um, on and on. Every movement is different. But there are these common elements that you can start to see. First of all, tremendous courage and a willingness to do what it takes to defend land and water and air despite tremendous police repression. And there is always tremendous police repression. These new kinds of coalitions um, often, as I said, healing, helping to heal very old wounds. This insistence that water is of greater value than money, that no price can be placed on children's health. The fact that women of all ages are overwhelmingly at the forefront of these movements, often in the role of water keepers. A deep love and fierce protection of place. The bold and creative use of law, often with indigenous rights, serving as the most powerful weapon. 
a revival of democracy at the local level, at the most local level. And I think the most interesting thing about this wave of resistance is the way in which alternatives and resistance are woven together. My friend John Jordan, who's a wonderful activist based in France, talks about resistance and alternatives being the twin strands of DNA. That you can't have one without the other. And we've often paid lis lis lip service to this, but more and more this is becoming the lived reality. Um, because people understand, who are on it, part of these frontline struggles, that they will not win unless they can demonstrate that there are other ways for communities to sustain themselves. So I think about the ranchers um, in Nebraska who built a clean energy barn uh, powered by wind and solar in the path of the proposed Keystone XL pipeline um, to show to themselves and their neighbors that they would actually get more energy from this one barn than they would get from the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, or a village in England that's in the midst of the fracking free-for-all, the dash for gas over there, um, that decided that rather than just saying no to fracking, they would start their own renewable energy co-op. Um, and this community had been tremendously divided over the you know, jobs versus the environment question. Um, but then even, a, even people who were on the pro-fracking side decided to join the co-op because they realized they would be actually getting less expensive energy and that it would keep resources in the community. So really um, showing, showing the alternatives instead of just talking about them. Or the Black West Mesa Water Coalition on Navajo land um, that is not just resisting coal after having successfully shut down um, large coal operations, but also uh, coming up with a concrete plan to convert land depleted by coal mining into um, a utility-scale solar power generating operation that would keep control and resources in the community rather than um, just take them out as so many green energy projects are doing. This understanding of the moral imperative to provide real economic alternatives to the suicidal economic path we're on um, is, I'm convinced, key to the success or failure of this historic moment, whether we rise to this historic moment. Because the simple truth um, is that the hope for humanity in many ways, at least in the climate context, rest in the hands of some of the poorest and most marginalized people on the planet, in our country and around the world. And by that I mean that the rapid rise in carbon emissions that we're seeing, um, as bad as Canada's record is, um, it's not happening in the global north. It's happening, the rise in emissions is happening in China, in India, in Brazil, in South Africa, because these countries are signing on to this same vision. Um, and that will not change unless there is another economic vision offered. Um, the biggest untapped pools of carbon, the ones that if burned will push us to four to six degrees of warming, catastrophic levels of warming, lie in indig on in under indigenous lands, whether in the Arctic or in Canada's tar sands. All of our resistance will only be a stopgap unless something fundamental changes in the balance of power between countries of the global north and south and within those countries. We will not stop climate catastrophe unless countries like Canada acknowledge our climate debt and help to finance transitions to another economic model entirely. We will continue on the path we're on, unless there are real economic opportunities in First Nations communities other than mining and fracking in Canada. Communities will continue to be divided unless we take those responsibilities seriously. And when we talk about honoring the treaties, um, that includes the commitments made for real infrastructure, for clean water, for education, for health care. When communities are asked to choose between water, clean water, healthcare, school, and opening up a mine, it's pretty clear what's gonna win in that case. So 
This is a moral responsibility. It's a collective responsibility. Now, one of the questions that you know, comes up most when I find I talk about these issues is more and more I think we recognize the depths of the challenge. But what we doubt, most of all, is our ability to rise to this challenge, our ability to do what it takes. Um, and I think it helps to look to the social movements of the past um, for inspiration and to also look at what went wrong. And I think that there are, um, there are some really important lessons when we look at that history. And one of them is that we tend to consistently win when we win um, the legal battles, the cultural battles, the representational battles. And we often lose those core battles for redistribution, the economic battles. Um, so we end up more with the symbolic victories and the entrenched inequalities stay in place. Um, there's a quote from Martin Luther King um, that is one of those quotes that doesn't get repeated enough, and it's from 1967. He says, the practical cost of change for the nation up to this point has been cheap. The limited reforms have been obtained at bargain rates. There are no expenses and no taxes are required for Negroes to share lunch counters, libraries, parks, hotels, and other facilities with, white, with whites. The real cost lies ahead. The discount education given to Negroes will in the future have to be purchased at full price if quality education is to be realized. Jobs are harder and costlier to create than voting rolls. The eradication of slums housing millions is complex, far beyond integrating buses and lunch counters. I think you could apply a similar analysis to so many of the liberation movements in whose footsteps we step. And this is not a criticism of those movements. It's just a fact that the second wave feminist movement was not just fighting um, for equality before the law, um, but also you know, the more radical elements were fighting for wages for housework, uh, for fundamental changes in the economy that would have required real distribution of wealth. The liberation, so many liberation movements had at their heart the redistribution of land and, the, and, and those parts of their movements were never won. We look at the great movement against apartheid in South Africa. They won the vote. They won the right to mobility. Um, but they were also planning to nationalize the banks and the mines. And it was that that was sacrificed. And that was the money that would have paid for the trans economic transformation in the townships. So on one level, we can say, we can, we, can, we can feel hopeless in the face of this history. But I've started to, feel, to, to look at this history differently, which is, I believe, that in rising to the climate crisis, if we really look at this and stop looking away, what we can see is that we have before us the ability to finish, to address the unfinished business of so many of our liberation movements. Because none of these movements went away. They never ended. They're still fighting. Um, and that addressing inequality, fundamental inequality, healing colonial wounds is fundamental to our ability to address this crisis. And it's on, it's on every level. We need massive investments in the public sphere if we're going to weather the storms ahead and cut our fossil fuel emissions. Those represent the jobs, um, the opportunities that Martin Luther King dreamed of, um, that are part of the reason Ferguson is on fire right now, um, the fact that that dream was never fulfilled. Um, and it's an opportunity to, to keep so many of the broken promises our ancestors made, um, or my ancestors made in this country as well. Um, I'm just gonna, making sure we have a time for questions here. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about what we can learn from the transformative movements of the past that did succeed in these big 
battles for redistribution of wealth because there have been big wins. We know that after the Great Depression, the New Deal era, um, there was a huge shift in the balance of powers. This was you know, the era when, when union membership soared, um, when, when owners and bosses were forced to share far more of their wealth than they wanted to. Um, and with that transfer of wealth came the building of so many social services and, and structures that we are fighting so hard to defend now um, in the face of relentless attacks. Um, it's also true that the abolition movement um, took on the most powerful uh, industry of its day and deprived the ability of slave owners to continue to make profit. It helped that the fossil fuel, uh, uh, the growth of uh, fossil fuels was waiting in the wings and a lot, of, um, a lot of those slave owners were able to transfer their money into the fossil fuel economy. Um, but, but it nonetheless represented um, a significant transfer of wealth. But we also know that that is another unfinished bit of liberation because reparations were never paid. In fact, reparations in many cases were paid to the slave owners but not to the slaves. Um, France was paid reparations for losing its slaves in Haiti. Um, British slave owners were paid huge amounts of money for the loss um, of their human property, but that property was never paid reparations to begin a new life. Our world is still scarred by these injustices. And, I, I, and it's not going away. If anything, uh, if, if these past years have made that clear, I hope it's made that clear. And, and we have a moment. We have a crisis. That is our moment to heal these wounds. It also means that the response to climate change does not need some shiny new movement that will magically succeed where all others fail. Rather, as the farthest reaching crisis created by the extractivist worldview and one that puts humanity on a firm and unyielding deadline, climate change can be the force the grand push that will bring together all of these still living movements, a rushing river fed by countless streams gathering collective force to reach the sea. Winning will certainly take a convergence of such diverse constituencies on a scale previously unknown. Because although there is no perfect historical analogy for the challenge of climate change, there are certainly lessons to learn from the transformative movements of the past. One such lesson is that when major shifts happen in the economic balance of power, they are invariably the result of extraordinary levels of social mobilization. At these junctures, activism becomes something that is not performed by a small tribe within the culture, whether that tribe is a vanguard of radicals or a subcategory of slick professionals, though each may play their part. It's something that is an entirely normal activity throughout society. It's rent payers associations and women's auxiliaries and gardening clubs and neighborhood assemblies and trade unions and professional groups and sports teams and youth leagues and so on. And Gabrielle mentioned the documentary that we made in Argentina. And I feel really lucky to have been in Argentina in that moment after the economic crisis in 2001 because I saw that, you know, this is often something we read about in history books, those moments when the whole society is in the streets. But I saw that in Argentina. On every street corner, there were neighborhood assemblies. And this idea of activism being something that is a specialist activity falls away. During extraordinary historical moments, both world wars, the aftermath of the Great Depression, the peak of the civil rights era, or these sorts of national uprisings that I'm describing, the usual categories dividing activists and regular people become meaningless because the project of changing society is so deeply woven into the project of life. Activists are, quite simply, everyone. And if we think about the task at head and the scale of capital that really needs to be challenged for us to safeguard the safety of our future, um, we, we need nothing less than that level of mobilization. The problem, once again, is that most of us living in post-industrial societies, when we see those crackling black and white footage of general strikes in the 1930s and victory gardens in the 1940s and freedom rides in the 1960s, many of us simply can't imagine being part of any mobilization of that depth and scale. And here I'm not talking about activists. You know, I think for many of us, we can imagine it. 
Um, but I think for a lot of people who don't identify as activists, that is the problem. And sort of the attitude is, you know, that kind of thing is fine for them, but not us, not with our eyes glued to our smartphones, attention spans scattered by clickbait, loyalties split by the burdens of debt and insecurities of contract work. Where would we organize? Who would we trust enough to lead us? Who, moreover, is we? In other words, we are products of our age and the dominant ideo ideological project. We have been changed by neoliberalism. This is a system that has taught us to see ourselves as little more than singular gratification-seeking units out to maximize our narrow self-interest, while simultaneously severing so much of us from the broader communities whose pooled skills are capable of solving problems big and small. This project also has led our governments to stand by helplessly for more than two decades as the climate crisis morphed from a grandchildren problem to a banging down the door problem. All of this is why any attempt to rise to the climate challenge will be fruitless unless it is understood as part of a much broader battle of worldviews, a process of rebuilding and reinventing the very idea of the collective, the communal, the commons, the civil, the civic, after so many decades of attack and neglect. And I think that's why so many of us were and continue to be so excited by the emergence of a union like Unifor and its commitment um, to social unionism and to the idea of reviving those principles in society because that is the first step to any of this. What is overwhelming about this challenge is that it requires breaking so many rules at once, rules written into national laws and trade agreements as well as powerful unwritten rules that tell us that no government can increase taxes and stay in power or say no to a major new uh, investment, no matter how devastating and damaging that project is, or plan to gradually contract those parts of our economies that endanger us all. We know this has to be done. It's just that we're told over and over and over again that it cannot be done. But yet each of these rules emerge out of the same coherent worldview. If that worldview is delegitimized, then all of the rules within it become much weaker and more vulnerable. This is another lesson from social movement history across the political spectrum. When fundamental change does come, it's generally not in legislative dribs and drabs spread out evenly over decades. Rather, it comes in spasms of rapid fire lawmaking with one breakthrough after another. The right calls this shock therapy, the left calls this populism because it requires so much popular support and mobilization in order to occur. So how do we change a worldview, an unquestioned ideology? I think part of it involves choosing the right early policy battles to fight, choosing our battles wisely. You know, to cite just one example, you know, climate activists usually talk about a carbon tax, um, but it may be that fighting for a marginal carbon tax is a lot less useful than forming a grand coalition to, to demand a guaranteed minimum income. And that's not only because a minimum income makes it possible for workers to say no to dirty energy jobs, but also because the very process of arguing for a universal social safety net opens up a space for a full-throated debate about values, about what we owe to one another based on our shared humanity, and what it is that we collectively value more than economic growth and corporate profits. Recent years have been filled with moments when societies suddenly decide they've had enough, defying all experts and forecasters. From the Arab Spring, tragedies, betrayals and all, to Europe's squares movement that saw city centers turned o turn taken over by demonstrators for months, to Occupy Wall Street, to the incredible students mo student movements in Quebec and Chile. The The Mexican journalist Luis Hernandez Navarro describes these rare political moments that seem to melt cynicism on contact as the effervescence of rebellion, which is the phrase I love. And what is most striking about these moments, these upwellings, is that they so often come as a surprise, most of all to the movement's own organizers. I've heard this story many times 
It goes like this. One day it was just me and my friends dreaming up impossible schemes. The next day the entire country seemed to be out in the plaza with us. And the real surprise for all involved is that we are so much more than we have been told. That we long for more, and in that longing, have more company than we ever imagined. I, as part of this documentary project, I, um, I, I spent a little time um, in Athens and, 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 and in other parts of Greece looking at the anti-extraction anti struggles. And I had the opportunity to interview Alexis Tsipras, who is um, the leader of the official opposition uh, in Greece, which is a, a left-wing political party called Syriza. And it's a very controversial political party because for a little while there, it was really the hope of the European left. Um, and um, and in, in some cases, it, it hasn't entirely lived up to expectations. So I had an interview with, with Alexis Tsipras uh, for the next day, and I was sitting with a group of, of activists in, um, in Athens the night before, and I asked, I was canvassing them, I said, what question, what should I ask him? What should I ask Alexis Tsipras? What would you ask? And people threw around a bunch of ideas. And then somebody said, ask him, history knocked on your door, did you answer? And I thought, that's a really good question for all of us. Thank you.